Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us for this morning's event for Children's Mental Health Week. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by some truly fantastic authors. I'm Zoe and I work at The Reading Agency, a national charity that tackles life's big challenges through the proven power of reading. This event uh, forms part of our virtual event series, The Reading Agency Presents, uh, and is supported by Reading Well for Young People, uh, which recommends expert endorsed books about mental health providing 12 to 18 year olds with advice and information about a wide range of issues. It's also being delivered in partnership with National Literacy Trust as part of Gittisington Reading, a three year project where we're working together with local partners to develop a community of happy, confident readers across the borough. But of course, we're so excited to welcome you all from schools across the UK this morning. So you probably don't need me to tell you that COVID-19 has significantly affected young people with the disruption to school and family life having a big impact on mental health. During this event, our panel will be drawing on their books as well as their own experiences to discuss various aspects of young people's mental health and the things in our complicated and ever-changing world that can sometimes make looking after it a challenge. They will also discuss how you can use your own agency and power to make a difference to your life. And if you don't know where to start, what do you do? A panel will also be answering your questions. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, please share it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, uh, or you can ask a teacher or librarian to share it for you. And we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Uh, just so you know, the chat box is private and all your questions will be anonymized. Just to note that we have enabled live subtitles for this event. Uh, if you'd like to turn these on or off, you can do so by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Before we start, I'd like to introduce our panel. So first up, we have Sita Brahmachari, who is an award-winning author, nominated for the Silip Carnegie Medal five times, who's won the Waterstones Children's Book Prize in 2011, and has been bespo bestowed with the IBB honor, IBBY honor, sorry. An ambassador for Amnesty, Sita is passionate about safeguarding human rights and diverse voices being heard, which comes through in her thoughtful and sensitive storytelling. Her book, Kite Spirit, uh, is on the Reading World book list for young people's mental health and her latest book, When Shadows Fall, is a touching yet unflinching YA novel about loss and self-destruction. Next up we have An Professor Anthony Kessel, who is a public health physician, academic and author, who works at NHS England HQ as Clinical Director for National Clinical Policy. He is an international authority on public health, a trustee director of Book Trust, and also advises other charities on global health and mental health. His debut teen novel, The Five Clues, was published by Crown House in August 2021 and is the first in the four book Don't Doubt the Rainbow Adventure series. And last but not least, we have David Harewood MBE, who is an actor, director, author and activist. With a career spanning almost 35 years, David has performed on the stage and the screen with credits including Homeland, Blood Diamond and The Night Manager, among many others. In September 2021, David's first book for adults, Maybe I Don't Belong Here, a memoir of race, identity, breakdown and recovery, was published to critical acclaim. Joining us this, mor this morning, we also have Charlotte Eyre. Charlotte is a freelance books journalist and reviews titles for the Bookseller magazine, where she was children's editor for eight years. She also presented the podcast Chapter and Verse, The Art of Selling Children's Books, which was all about the children's book market, and we're very excited to have her leading our discussion this morning. So without further ado, I am delighted to hand over to Charlotte, who will kick us off. Thank you. It's lovely to be here with uh, Sita, Anthony and David and with everybody uh, watching from your schools. I really hope we're going to have a really interesting discussion and I can't wait to hear some of your questions. But it's my turn first. So it, what would be really great is if um, everybody, we can talk about your books. Please could you introduce them and tell us how they deal with the subject of mental health. Sita, would you mind going first? Okay, so um, I'll talk a little bit about Kite Spirit and When Shadows Fall. Kite Spirit has a, a female protagonist and it's about the perils of perfectionism and thinking that failing is, failing once means you fail every time. And, uh, and that's what that story is about. It's about learning how to fly again when you've had a mental health challenge. It's seen through the eyes of a 16 year old girl called Kite. And my latest novel, When Shadows Fall, is seen through the eyes of 18 year old uh, Kai, um, who is excluded from the education system 
He is a mixed race young man and he is struggling with his mental health and he is, he is thrown out onto a wreck. And it is his friends, his incredible friends and good people in the community who help him find his way back to flying again. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, you've also written um, a fiction book, but you've also um, included the three principles within that. So tell me about what the story's about and what the three principles are. Yes, sure. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Um, so uh, my book, the, the Five Clues, which is uh, the first in the four book, Don't Doubt the Rainbow series, is centered around a 13 year old young detective called Edie Marble, who a year after her mother's apparent accidental death, finds out at the stone setting um, that it wasn't an accident and her mum has left her a set of clues, the five clues, um, to uh, solve a crime. Her mum's a human rights investigator. Uh, and in doing so, to help her come to terms or to learn to live with the, the loss of her mother and all the grief that surrounds that. So uh, in terms of mental health, you have a 13 year old, it's a straight detective adventures book, but you have a 13 year old who's dealing with grief, loss, bereavement, anxiety, sadness, normal human emotions, and also psychological health challenges in this book and the others. But alongside that, as you've just said, I've threaded through the whole series an approach called the three principles to understanding um, how we experience uh, life, how our psychological system works, which is being taught around schools uh, in terms of improving psychological health and well-being. So I've threaded that. So there's a sort of sub-theme of, of tools to help children improve their own mental health. Wonderful. And David, your book is slightly different. It's not fiction, but it's rather it's a memoir. Um, tell me about why you wrote the memoir and why you wanted to talk about your mental health journey. Um, it's interesting just hearing what Cesar just said there uh, that um, I mean, my book, my book um, uh, came about because, uh, in a sense, I, I, in recovering from my own um, um, mental breakdown uh, 30 years ago, I sort of just buried it and decided not to not to refer to it, just forget all about it, and 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 didn't think it had any significance. And then um, I inadvertently tweeted that I'd had a breakdown um, and uh, a couple of a couple of years ago and that led to some exploration as, as to as to why I think it happened I made a documentary called psychosis and me which uh, allowed me to explore the uh, roots of my own psychological struggles uh, and, and that really surprised me uh, I learned through making the documentary that most of what I remembered was false, or false memories, and that I buried a whole uh, load of pain that um, had been just too, too difficult for me to uh, um, access uh, and too problematic for me to access. So in, in, in making the documentary, I, as I discovered all this, this wealth of uncomfortable truths um, to do with race, to do with my identity, uh, and uh, I, I struggled with that for a couple of years, and I have to say to everybody who's listening that even the idea of being known as an author is extraordinarily exciting and really still mind-blowing for me, because the idea that I then sought to sort of un write about these experiences, and, and in, in doing so, it, it's been really quite cathartic, because I've not only have I faced a lot of these fears and a lot of these uh I would say deeply buried, uh, uncomfortable truths, but in facing them, it's been the making of me. I would say it's been really a liberating, cathartic experience where I've been able to look not just at my um, theatrical career, my, my, my professional career, but my personal history, uh, my struggles with race and fitting in, in, in fitting into the, into the environments that I found myself in as a child, in facing all of those, very uncomfortable truths i found it extremely liberating and uh, it, uh, and and the book has enabled me to um really appreciate my family my friends uh my own story my father in particular and and the journey that he took uh, and the brave journey that he took so it's been it's been an enormously cathartic experience where i've sort of faced up to some of the uncomfortable truths 
that maybe as people we tend to shy away from at times in our lives. Definitely. And I wanted to ask you specifically about um, the racism and the racism that you endured uh, growing up. And for young people experiencing racism or sort of other forms of discrimination now, uh, what what would you say? What would be your advice to those people who are perhaps listening to this or have read your book and thought, well, hang on, I've experienced things like that as well. How do I sort of deal with this problem? It's interesting that you know, obviously, these are these are different times. I think growing up in the sixties and seventies was 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 particularly difficult because um, you know, we were that first generation of other, and and you know, we were dealing with with you know, the extremities of things like the National Front and, you know, uh, uh, and a very aggressive um, sort of rejection of, of, of who we were. Um, but I think, you know, it's a very different world today. And it's, I think, I think the racism is still there. It's a lot more subtle, um, a lot more um, complex. But I still think that, um, you know, children growing up in a society that deems them other, it still has a uh, very pernicious uh, uh, um, effect on, 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 on people's mental health. Just that, just that sort of low drumbeat that's telling you you're not of, you're not, you know, you're not really, you know, you, that's why the book is called Maybe I Don't Belong Here. There's, there's this drumbeat that you're somehow, you don't belong, that you're not really British or that, um, um, that, uh, that, as I say, that you don't necessarily belong. So I think the situation is is, is different. But I would I would encourage people to to um, to read and to and to really understand the world that they're in because a lot of people are, are talking about this. And if, as I say, even though the, the drumbeat of politics can be um, can, can be um, you know, almost trying to send us back to the 1950s, trying to send us back to a time when, when everything was fine and you know, Britain was predominantly white. Uh, I, 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 I still think that there are shoots to hang on to that make us, can make young people feel like they do belong. I say the writing, even some of the music. I mean, I was listening to, looking at the Brits last week and some of the lyrics of these young rappers are incredibly profound. And um, I, 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 I think that there are stories everywhere that can sort of help us help us understand our sense of displacement, our sense of rejection, and 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 it's important to know that, and for individuals to know that they are not dealing with it on their own. That these a lot of these things are universal, mm -hmm. and and a lot of these feelings of uncomfortable of displacement. Are universal so it's important I think to read to listen to reach out because um, uh, uh, because I think you'll find that you know th this isn't targeted at individuals this is targeted at specific groups and, and um, uh, lots of people are, are, are experiencing these difficulties and lots of people are writing about them lots of people are talking about them and you'll find comfort in fact that other people are experiencing a similar thing to yourself. Yeah, that's true. And Sita, some of your characters have go through these feelings as well, don't they, in their in their journeys? Yeah, I mean, so much of what David talked about is is has an element of of Kai and Omid and Orla, these young people that live around this uh, city wreck. Um, they're the experiences that they that they live with in their generation, but also they inherit some of the trauma from the previous generations. So Dexter, for example, Kai's father grew up in care and um, had a very bad experience of school. So before Kai even get not not wanting to, but he's kind of sending messages to Kai that school is not a safe place for him. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, so the trauma that kind of gets passed through generations is always something to be aware of. And people's perception of what is real. David talked about memory and false memory. And Kai is writing this journal. And in his journal, he's constantly checking himself. Could I have remembered that? Could I have really been in love with Orla at that point when I was that young? Or could I have understood that that's what was going on with my parents? He's asking his 18-year-old self, he's checking that he could have understood that. And he's trying to piece himself together from nursery to sixth form. 
and um, he's, he's, he's trying to understand how he got into the traumatic state that he got into. And there's a moment in the story where uh, Kai splits and um, he has a psychosis and he splits into two Raven characters. And the Raven characters almost become his parents. And he speaks through these Raven characters. And in one way, you can say, you can sort of, you know, Anthony Castles here as a, a health professional, you could say that is, you could, you could prescribe that and you could say that is a psychosis. But you could also say, in terms of a story, he is trying to find a place to be, a place to belong, um, which is David as well, we're talking about. It's been this constant theme in my stories. David also talked about his dad. And, um, you know, I had this really sort of profound feeling for my dad, who was a doctor, came here in 1959 to be in the National Health Service. He worked all his life. I had this really profound feeling as a child of his frustration of some of the very real structural racisms that he experienced. And I, could, I couldn't quite understand, I couldn't quite put my finger on, on what his sadness was sometimes about. And I think that I do understand what that is now. And I think that Kai, as he's narrating the story, is trying to work a few things out about why it hasn't been, um, people talk about leveling up, why it hasn't been a level playing field for him, but also what he understands through writing his journal. And uh, David talked about this too, the catharsis of writing, mm. which I found myself, a, a place to be, a place to speak, a place to find a voice. Um, he, he does that through dance. He does it through, mu his dad does it through music. His friend Omid, who is a refugee survivor, does it through art. Orla does it through running. They find a way to be where they can find a, a safe place to be at home. My absolute inspiration as a, as, a, as a young reader was Maya Angelou. Mm. When I read Maya Angelou, everyone, I always say there's a book for everyone, um, but you might not have found it yet. When I found Maya Angelou, it was like, oh my goodness, I can breathe again. Because there is somebody there that is looking at the real world, but is also finding way through, but has this incredible imagination that's talking about identity and diaspora and her roots and branches. And I just, I just, I, I, want to, I, I want to read you what I read from her because she's really inspired me to write this story. She says, the ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. Mm. And when I, when I really understood that and read that in her, her history is not my history, but there were connections in terms of colonialism in ter and uh, in terms of what I understood to be that the spaces where my family couldn't exist and didn't belong. Where are you from? No, but where are you really from? How many times have I been asked that question? Oh, but mm. you were born here. Oh, sometimes people speaking slowly to me because they assume that in, you know, in, 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 you know, as, as a child in rural places, but even sometimes now they assume that I, you are other. And you think, well, but I was born here and my mum's from the Lake District and my dad was from So in a way, all of the narratives of belonging and identity and history and diaspora that I've been trying to tell and that Kai is really struggling with, and it affects his mental health and it affects his sense of the space that is his and that he can take up. And one of the things that I've placed in, in my book is the opening of consciousness of all of these young people that they do have a place that that could be a green space that they are nurturing, a sort of a, a sort of wilderness and garden that they're in the city demanding that they keep their space, or it could be dance, or it could be writing. And at the, at the end of the story, Kai, the wonderful artist Natalie Syrett, who, who does the imagery, um, which is through the eyes of a refugee survivor, a child called Omid, a young man called Omid. He's drawn this picture at the end of the book and the clever artist, he, look at his shoulders, how relaxed he is at the end of the story. Because mm. he's done it, he's found a way through, he's gonna have more challenges, but he's found a way through and he's found a way to piece his narrative together. Yeah, yeah. no, he has. No, it's, it's a wonderful, gorgeous book I, and I recommend that everyone should read it. Now, Anthony, um, the heroine of your story, her life is turned upside down by the death of her mother. and. Young people nowadays are living with all kinds of uncertainties. You know, we've just had a pandemic, there's Brexit, you know, on top of all these questions of identity and, you know, that the other panelists have been mentioning. Um, 
Edie finds some purpose in this quest that is given to her. But for young people watching this, who are saying, well, I haven't got a quest. I mean, what can they do to sort of find a cause or a passion, get some meaning and give themselves some meaning in their lives? I think, yes, you're absolutely right. Now, it's a fiction book and, and uh, most people hopefully won't encounter that kind of scenario. But um, the pandemic has um, brought about what appears to be all kinds of uncertainty and change. And I think it's extraordinary. I mean, we know for sure that during this, uh, the last two years, there's been a huge rise in uh, mental health problems. The Royal College of Psychiatry has talked about a crisis in mental health, especially in children. So there's been, a, there's been a definite rise in depression, anxiety, eating disorders, stress, phobias, the whole breadth. It's been a really, really difficult period for children. But with it, within all of that, um, there's something very deep, I think, about what it means for there to be uncertainty and change. You hear it all the time, um, uncertainty and change that the pandemic has caused. What does that mean? And... I think actually what we've experienced is a pandemic in people's awareness of uncertainty and change because uncertainty and change exists all the time. Nobody knows what's going to happen. To, I don't know what's going to happen for the rest of today, let alone tomorrow, let alone next week. But we build our lives, especially in the Western world, as if we do, as if we do. And all of that is premised on this innocent misunderstanding of the relationship between thought and feelings which is what's one of the things that's at the heart of of uh, of my books as you know and what i mean by that is uh, when, when we go around in schools and uh, with the mental health uh, resilience programs and ask children where do you think your feelings are coming from people almost unequivocally say well they come from the outside world i feel bad or i feel depressed when uh, it's a science class I don't like when Arsenal lose, when Spurs win, um, all those kinds of things. They, they assign their feelings to, to something that's going on in the outside world. Um, but it's not possible for anything in the outside world to create your feelings, to create happy feelings or to create sad feelings. It all happens through your thinking in the moment. And that's an innocent misunderstanding of the relationship between our thoughts and our feelings. What happens is if you believe the outside world is responsible for feeling good, you try and control that to feel good. Or if you think it's responsible for you feeling sad or unhappy or depressed or discouraged, then you try and control that which you think in the outside world is responsible for that. And that's what causes great um, stress and pressure and that's where people think that they can control the outside world and create certainty, when the reality is that uncertainty doesn't exist. And what we found is so powerful is that if children understand, and adults, that the, that the source of their experiences, the source of their feelings and emotions actually comes from within, not from the outside world, you can, it liberates you from the sadness, from the stress, from the strain. And what I've done in, in my book is, yes, Edie, you're absolutely right. She experiences this tragic sudden death of her mother. Um, but during the course of her investigations, she learns to live with the loss through both, through both unraveling the clues and solving the crime, through dealing with various mental health challenges that come along her way, and through this approach that teaches her um, where the source of her feelings come from and she also has it's also about the relationships with the other people and friendship is something that you all talk about in your books really beautifully and david your friendship with your childhood friend luigi is mm. um, was one of my favorite parts of your book and was so touching and his belief in you really helped mm. you become an actor can you talk to us about him and why he was such an important person in your life um well mainly just laughed you know we just laughed all the time he made me um a very very happy person i, I need to you know I, I, as you say his support and belief um just never wavered and and having somebody that was so uh convinced of of, of your of your talents and so convinced of of your impending success was um really infectious and uh you know we we spent a lot of time together throughout throughout our lives that spoke to each other nearly every day and um, but it was really underpinned with laughter and fun and um 
and, and not taking things too seriously. It's wonderful what the what uh, uh, you know uh, what what uh, Anthony just said. You know the the idea that you know that things outside are not responsible for uh, you know your feelings. That's a really really interesting uh, I, I, idea to to, 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 to grasp. Um, and Louis was always reminding me of that. He was always sort of sort of reminding me that no, it's you. You know, you're the talented one. You're the person that's, you know, despite the fact that I was, you know, not working or that I wasn't getting a phone, the phone wasn't ringing. I mean, it's interesting, again, my auntie talks about, you know, living with uncertainty. As actors, we constantly live with uncertainty. Mm. Uh, and, and um, w w y you know, it's, it's so easy to think that because the phone's not ringing, you're not very good. Or because the phone's not ringing, um, nobody wants you. And... Uh, Louis was always reminding me that that's irrelevant. That's just because there's maybe not the opportunity, or that's because you know maybe they don't know know who you are, or you know it's not because of you. It's not because you're not worthy. You're totally worthy, and it's just they haven't found you yet, or they haven't put the two and two together. And when they do, it's gonna. It's, it, I mean, he was just convinced of it, and. You know, that's the saddest part was that literally on his birthday, the, the year after he died, on his birthday, I get the biggest, the biggest job of my life, which completely changed my career and turned, turned my life upside down. So he was absolutely right. It was just literally, you know, my talent meeting the opportunity and, and bang. So, so it, was, it was nothing to do with me or my, my failings in, in any way. It was just... Um, uh, you know, it was, it was just, as I say, you know, the, the, the correct timing. And it, 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 even today, you know, even though he's not, 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 a, not around anymore, I, I, I constantly think of that. I constantly think of him and, you know, and this is the first time I've been, this is the longest I've been back in England for like nearly 10 years. And, um, you know, occasionally, this is actually the longest I haven't worked in, in, in and I've only been out of work three weeks, but it's, but it's, it's literally like, oh, what do I do now? But I, that it's very easy for me to sort of, if 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 I hadn't have experienced this last year where I've written the book and and found this moment of catharsis with an understanding, um, you know, sometimes I find that, you know, I'll get up and I'll think, well, what am I going to do today? And there'll be the moment where my thoughts start getting negative. And then I remind myself, just with what Anthony says, it's not about, I have no control over that. Uh, and, and I remind myself that of the resilience, that I, the resilience that I've shown in not only getting through uh, my career, the downtime, the hard times, I remind myself of that resilience. And I say to myself, I'm okay. I, you know, I, I'm okay. You know, there's, 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 there's no, you know, bogeyman out there that's just, these are all just un, un they're, they're just fears and anxieties which occasionally crop up and when they do as anthony said well i, I haven't read anthony's book but I, I would i would imagine i immediately replace that negative thought with a pop with a with a positive one and and i'll just relax for a moment look at the sunshine maybe go for a walk you know and i'll turn that negative thought into a positive one because I have no control over that. I have no control over it whatsoever. Um, understanding that and, and really getting a grip of that has, uh, has been really beneficial to me. And even though Louis is no longer here, you know, his memory and his infectious laughter just is still there in my head. So I remind myself of that and, and yeah. no, that's all, really all is well. Um, and CT, you also write beautifully about friendships. Um, and could you talk to us a little bit about what happens when friendships are difficult? Because there may be people watching this saying, oh, but I've just fallen out with my friend. I want David, the, the relationship David had with Louis, I want that, but I've just fallen out with my friend or my friends don't understand me when I'm sad. And I think that's something that your characters experience. What kind of words of advice could you give? Yeah, so, um, so, so the, the, the really deep bonded friendships in the story were a complete joy to write and I actually still have my own um, like friends from when I was at nursery who occasionally I see and it's just amazing that thing of somebody knowing you the whole of your life 
my David was saying that somebody just get they have your back. And there's a line in, in Winchester's for the Omid who has arrived in year eight. He has survived his refugee journey. He doesn't have much English, but he has incredible insight. And he meets Kai and he recognizes the trauma in this boy that, that is growing up here and excluded from school. And he says, when shadows fall, Kai, you stand beside. And he just, he says it in this really like, this is what you do. This is what I know. And this is what you do. And he says, I can't speak to you because my English isn't fluent yet, but I will paint you the picture. And so he basically shows Kai a bit of what he's going through in image. And images can be really, really powerful. But there's another relationship, which is Kai and Zach. And Zach is like Kai's best mate from the first day of nursery. Zach comes from a much more privileged place than Kai, although he comes from a very similar heritage. And um, at a certain point in the book, Zach sort of gets cancelled because Kai thinks, how are you? You are basically the golden boy and you're going to have all the help you need. And I'm not going to have the help that I need. And written into this book, because it's sort of written through Kai, then there's a certain point when he splits where he can't write the story anymore and his friends have to write the story. That's my, been my thing about, you know, your name might be on a book, but if you could think of all the people that have helped you be where you are, your friend, David, you know, all of the, you know, the, maybe the teacher that went, you know what, Sita, you could be a writer. And mm. you go, no, that's not going to happen. And then they turn up at your book launch or something, you know, it, as a, a very else, all those people have had your back. They are in these stories. And basically, Zach, uh, Zach and Kai become separate for a lot of the story. And as the story goes on, I don't want to do a plot spoiler, but as the story goes on, you realize that Zach never loses faith in his friend. He is always trying to find a way through. And he's always got his friends back. And there are also other people that the young adults can go to who, who can kind of help them ease their way through the problems that they have. They sort of get into some quite big tangles as we all do in friendship groups. Um, and, and some of the young people have to go and speak to the adults and say, Zach, Zach is one, one of the people that speaks to the adults and says, you know what, I think Kai's in trouble here. And like in the story, Kai sort of hates him for it. But as you're reading it, you kind of think, you know what? He sort of did the right thing. I can see why Kai didn't like him, but he did the right thing. So what Anthony was talking about was also, and, and David was talking about was uncertainty. But also in my stories, there's, there are these sort of anchors. And I think the, the three principles are like that too, where the young people get together in a community and they go you know what they're going to take this piece of land away from us we're going to do something and we're going to do it together so at the beginning of the story Kai thinks he's writing his journal through the eye and as he goes on he realizes that it's always we it's always we he is never truly alone even when he thinks he is oh that's wonderful and that's such a lovely message for us to hear um mm. Anthony it'd be really lovely could you talk to us about some book recommendations, perhaps non-fiction or even fiction that people can read to either understand, better understand their mental health or lift their mood. Absolutely. May I say something on friendship first as well, oh, if that's cool. okay? Because I thought that was a fantastic discussion. And uh, David's friend, Louis, was onto something. He was onto truth, a truth about the human condition. And he knew it, maybe without even realizing exactly where it came from. But he was absolutely spot on. And I think Sita's book for, for people listening today is a, um, is a really remarkable exploration of friendship and mental health challenges. And I'd, I'd highly recommend that. But in relation to just, just friendships, friendships are, are hard to navigate as children, as adults. But being in community, being in contact with people is very much a natural human innate condition we're born to be with other people to connect with other people and it's sometimes like other aspects of our essence like compassion like the ability to love like the uh, uh, ability to be creative all these things that we're born with that are inside us they get covered up at times and they become more difficult and they get covered up for various reasons, social difficulties, family difficulties, other upsets, often overthinking in our own heads, cover up what is deep inside us. And it's a question of 
uncovering that. It's a question of uncovering that which lies within already and let, allowing it to flower. And my, my sort of advice for children who have challenges with friends, if you have a falling out, if you're upset with something that a friend's done, upset with something that a friend has said to you, is to take a moment, step away and ask yourself, have I ever done something like that myself? Have I ever spoken to someone like that myself? Have I ever behaved in that kind of way? And inevitably the answer is, if you have a quiet moment to think about it, well, probably yes. And I regret it and I didn't really mean it. And it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. And you can then think about your other friend like that. And you can think in terms of forgiveness. And forgiveness is an extraordinary thing. You can forgive the person whilst not if you like forgiving or forgetting their behavior, but that can be incredibly powerful in terms of moving, moving on, learning from whatever's happened and, and, and maintaining that friendship. So and in terms of um, books, what I've suggested, obviously, uh, um, Sita's books, I think they're quite, quite remarkable, really. Um, I also, the books of Phil Earl, I think cover um, um, Mind the Gap is a very small, powerful book about, uh, about uh, mental health challenges in the context of also of loss. I thought Angie Thomas's Thug, which is now a few years, The Hate You Give, is an incredible book. It really, really spoke to me. There's a movie made of it, as people know. But the book is absolutely tremendous. But you don't have to just read books about with mental health challenges or problems, just reading for pleasure. Distraction, David talked about the power of distraction when you've got something on your mind. Well, books take you into distraction. They lessen that overthinking, that over busy mind that causes such stress and strain. The really reading anything that you enjoy is fantastic. Then there are some books that have mental health themes uh, and we've all written some of those um, are great as well. But I think anything um, is really good. But I, I'd recommend Angie Thomas. And I think just for great fun, um, I loved uh, Holly Jackson's A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I thought that was, uh, for this, I thought that was a terrific read. Definitely. And David, what do you read for fun when you want to sort of distract <laughs> yourself and just take some time away from the stresses and strains of everyday life? Well, you know, as an, as an, as an actor, I find um, that I'm constantly reading scripts uh, I, I, I regret to inform everybody that, um, uh, I, I, you know, in terms of, I, I haven't been one to, 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 to read books. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of actor that if I'm reading a script, I cannot read anything else. If I'm reading, if I'm studying a play, that's, I have to read the play or, or else my mind sort of, I find, I find that I, I'm not completely sort of in character. So for instance, this last play that I was doing, um, Best of Enemies was probably one of the most difficult plays I've ever done because a lot of it was verbatim, um, uh, and so I, I I've never dried so much in my life where you forget your lines on stage and find yourself standing on stage in front of five hundred people not knowing what you're going to say next. Mm -hmm. So so um, it, it was a, was a, that was a really difficult one. So I tend to find that I I'm reading scripts a lot uh, the, the scripts that I'm working on they they are they become my distraction so I sort of throw myself into that but I would encourage kids to and I really regret this as a uh, as an as an adult I regret that I didn't find books sooner because they really are a as Anthony said a great distraction and are also great to disappear into them you know I, I you know remember reading you know, the Master of Margarita. It's first, the first, one of the first books I ever read, and just finding myself laughing out loud on on the top of this double decker bus, as a you know, young fourteen year old kid, reading this obscure Russian writer. I don't know how. I don't even know how I got the book, but it, I just found myself literally laughing out loud to myself at, 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 at this one particular chapter, and I just thought, how amazing is it that the you know. A, 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 that, that a book can take you away and inspire you, you know, in, um, like that. And, you know, we have Audible now, so you can listen to books and stuff. Mm. So I would really encourage people to, 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 to get into reading and, and you know, there's a whole array of different subjects that you can, you can choose from, find them. educational books, history books. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I find myself, I walk the dog every day and I find myself listening to a whole range of different stuff. 
and it's just really really inspiring to 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 to, to understand how something like you know something somebody's word somebody's imagination can, can spark ideas and, and and inspire you so uh, I, I regret that I didn't find it sooner Oh, that's so true. But I think I love the tip for Audible. I think audio books mm. are fantastic. And podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts while I go for a mm. run where I'm cleaning the house, things like that. Um, Sita, can you talk quickly about the importance of finding creative outlets? Because you are such a creative person and you don't just sort of write books in a very linear way. There's, you know, poetry and prose and artwork. Talk to me a little bit about that. The whole thing is, for me, is a completely immersive creative process. Um, I've said to Anthony in the past, you know, when you're in flow and, you know, when you're in flow, you can like sit at your desk. It's very bad for you. You mustn't do this. You can sit at your desk and you know, say my my children would have gone to school and the doorbell would go and it'd be 3.30. And I'd be like, what? What? You know, I, 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 mm. the day had gone, forgotten to don't do that. That's very bad for your mental health. Don't do that. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's also amazing because it's like you've been in this world. You've been transported into this world. And my brother laughs a lot at me because for my 13th birthday, you know, I don't know what most people get for their 13th birthday now, but even in, when I was growing up, you didn't get a chair for your 13th birthday. But I lived in this kind of big family where I just wanted my reading chair and my writing chair. Nobody was allowed to sit in this chair. It was my chair. My brother's like, yeah, we always thought there was something with you because you know you think you might be able to do it. Um, and I wanted that reading chair. It was my world. It was my space, and nobody could take it from me. And um, I want to, I want to say that Maya Angelou was the person that opened my consciousness portal, and I have to own that. Um, that when I was growing up, there wasn't a whole YA thing going on, or, you know, um, but she was the person that did that for me. And I still, when I'm writing, because like David, when you're, when you're performing or writing, it's sometimes hard to kind of have all of these different characters in your head to go into another story. So when I'm writing, I read poetry and I would really mm. recommend, you know, the complete works of Maya Angelou to everybody. They're not on school curriculums. You know, you might have one poem. Read the whole collection because, you know, as in When Shadows Fall, Kai speaks through poetry, he speaks through song, he speaks through prose, uh, Omid speaks through art. We all speak, we all can speak in many different ways. You know, D David talked in his novel about acting and the place to be that he found there. I think sometimes when people feel that their voice isn't amplified in society, they need that place even more. And uh, I did as a child. And the place that I went to more than reading was writing. So I've got, so journal writing, diary writing is the really big thing in my stories. And I want to recommend this because David, I think if you'd have found this book, um, you know, as a, as a young person, you would have had all of these writers to go, you mm. know what? I really like that writer's voice. I really like the way they kind of, you know, represent that character. And then you would have gone and found more. This was written in lockdown. Uh, it was the idea of Catherine Rundell, wonderful author that mm. you probably know. And she just phoned all these, these authors up and went, will you do something? Will you do something for this book of hope? And I, I you know, we were all in COVID, all in lockdown. I wrote this little story about a memory that I had about my dad. And Jane Ray, the wonderful illustrator who I work with a lot, she illustrated my dad. There he is. I wrote it because I thought I was thinking about the way that he listened and I have on my desk this conch this listening conch the biggest recommendation that I can give to you is when you read you listen to another world mm. you know you are transported somewhere else mm. and the, the one of the biggest things you can do for your friends and for yourself is also listen very carefully to what people say to you and don't always like jump in and say something reading gives you that magical portal where you can you can sit with yourself and this other world and your your mental health and your space and your world can grow so that's why i had a 13 year old reading chair wow <laughs> Gosh, it's been so wonderful to talk to you all today i'm now going to hand um the reins back to zoe because i know she's got some fantastic questions from all of you guys at home to ask our panel I do. Thank you so much to all of you. That was a really, really brilliant and really moving discussion as well. Thank you. Um, so we do have lots of great questions. 
um, coming in. I'm going to do a fairly speedy uh, round of them and we'll see how many we can fit in. Just to shout out though, Jess, uh, JSTC uh, in Lincolnshire who have posted a million brilliant questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to try and answer as many as possible. So to get started, the first question I have is, uh, can you personally relate to the stories that you have written or do you find it more powerful to write about other people and their personal experiences? Uh, so maybe, Anthony, uh, do you want to kick us off with that one? I have utterly drawn from my own experiences in terms of my writing and uh, uh, that just comes naturally to me. So, um, you know, my there's a 13 year old uh, star detective uh, in my books, but I have a daughter, she's now 21, but um, there have been, if you look at the acknowledgements, <laughs> there have been some references to her during the course of the book or she's informed that. But I utterly, utterly draw from my own experiences and uh, I echo what Sita said about when you're writing, you're absolutely in that creative, uh, creative zone. Um, and, um, you know, I, I've been a huge reader since I was a child. People are putting up the books that they read um, and have, have inspired them. Mine is, mine is rather more simple. I, I found this when I was, my, my parents had died recently and I found my mum had kept, this is a very old, The Three Investigators, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, but uh, that was uh, part of a great series. And I found myself um, immersed during my uh, childhood in reading. And um, so, yes, I mean, I draw from my own experiences and I think everyone has a creative spark inside them and you can express it in so many different ways. We all do, we're born with that. I've said it before, whether it's in art or writing or pottery, uh, we all have it. And, uh, and people should, everybody listening, children should try and explore as much as they can how to express that. Definitely. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Sita, do you have any, any thoughts on that one? Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm just going to show you this painting palette. I've, I've always got props. <laughs> this is She's got so many props. Palette. I've got props. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that I used to work in theatre. All right, so this is the painting palette of Nana Josie in my first novel, Artichoke Heart. It's a real-life painting palette of my mother-in-law, Rosie, and she got this palette when she was three years old and all the paintings of her life she did on this palette. I've got lovely paintings of hers, but if anyone should take this, I would be heartbroken because this has all the textures, all the times she tried to paint something, what she revisited, all the colors that she was inspired by. And these have all the paintings of her life on it. And for me, it's my metaphor about, you know, you, you try something, you go there, don't throw it away, keep it, bring it back, keep trying something, keep trying. And that's my, you know, that's really my kind of process through the arts. Sometimes I'll do it through poetry. Sometimes I'll do it through art. I'm a doodler. So I often start my books by doodling. And, um, you know, I'm not a great artist, but, you know, that's, that's where you start. So I think find that creative spark, whatever it is, and that's your place to go to. And whenever, you know, there's difficulties or challenges, if you go back to that place and keep building on that, as, Dave, as, as you know, David's friend knew, something will come at some point. I waited till I was 40 to start writing these novels because I just didn't have the confidence to do it. Mm. I didn't think people like me wrote novels or the characters I put in these books. These characters are from my own experience and some of them are from wanting to see all of these diverse young people represented in a way that they weren't there when I was a child. Um, but they're also from my working community and with refugee people. And the character of Omid is an absolute homage to the unaccompanied refugee children who are walking the world today. And he, he in the story, in fact, without Omid in the story, against the cultural narrative of the times, without Omid in the story, Kai might not have had such a good story to tell. Thank so thank yeah, you. yeah, there are many ways, many ways to express yourself. Thank you. I love your paint palette as well. It's so pretty. It's like a piece of art in itself. It's so colourful. It is. Um, yeah. That leads me on to another question, actually. Um, somebody has said, uh, have you ever struggled with what you wanted to be when you were younger? Well, like what you wanted to be when you grew up uh, as a job? And David, I know you were talking a bit about kind of the uncertainty of um, uh, involved in being an actor, um, as brilliant as that job is. But did you ever have any kind of uh, struggles with when you were thinking about what you might like to be? I had no idea what I wanted to do. And, you know, as I say in my book, it was only, a, thankfully, a teacher 
grabbed me, you know, two weeks before I was about to leave school and said, we think you should be an actor. Bing, light bulb, <laughs> eureka moment. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of the times, you know, you don't see the things, you don't see it in yourself. It's somebody else, somebody else's idea. You know, t- uh, so lucky, luckily for me, it was a, it was a, an English teacher, Mr. Reader, who suggested acting. And lo and behold, that's what I am 40 years, 40 years later. So oftentimes you don't see it in yourself and it will be a struggle. And I see that in my own children, you know, where they don't quite know what they want to do. They know what area they want to do. They know roughly what they want to do. My daughter, my daughter was doing a foundation year at uh, university and, you know, she thought she knew what she wanted to do. Um, and then she get, gets there on the first day and she's offered an alternative and she thinks, well, that alternative sounds interesting. And she ends up doing the alternative and now she's loving the alternative and, and that's inspired her to do something else. So. I would say to, to 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 the young people out there who may be struggling with that, it's part of the process, and and um, uh, don't be worried by that uncertainty. Again, embrace it mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and hold firm because oftentimes, you know, they, as they always say, it's, it's darkest before dawn, and you know you might find that at the last minute something will come up which will take you in a completely different direction. So don't 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 worry about those anxieties. I would almost say embrace them. Definitely. I think that's brilliant advice. Thank you. I echo everything you said. Um, so somebody has said, amazing discussion. Thank you. Uh, and then they've asked, I'm wondering if any of the panellists have any advice for young people whose friends might be experiencing a mental health low. How would you go about supporting them through it? So I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit already. But um, Anthony, I don't know if you want to um, maybe take that one. Yeah, very happy to. Um, I think uh, I can put my uh, health professional hat on for a second here. And I think um, a problem shared is a problem halved is what uh, comes to mind. And I would really, really encourage people if they're having any kind of um, psychological health challenge problem, talk to somebody. It doesn't really matter who you talk to. Talk to a friend. Talk to a parent if you want to, but it might not be a parent. It might be another relative. Talk to a teacher. If you can't, if you don't feel like you want to talk to those people, you can from 12 or 13, go and talk to your GP, talk to somebody. And if you don't feel like talking to somebody directly like that, there's lots of fabulous online resources, the charities Mind, uh, Samaritans, if it's an eating disorder, there are some fa- fabulous uh, uh, and really impressive charities that provide immediate um, services. So talk to somebody because we know that, um, so that mental health problems, psychological health problems are seeded in childhood. By the age of 25, most people who have adult mental health problems say later on, well, I I had those experiences and those problems when I was a child first. It's something like 50 to 75% of adult mental health problems are seeded in childhood. And we also know that if you catch things early, the outcomes are so much better. So don't Mm -hmm. sit with it. The anxiety that's created by sitting with it, with brewing, with stewing, with allowing years to pass whilst you're living with it can be averted. Talk to somebody, talk to a friend, talk to a health professional if you feel able to it, share it, and and that will enable you hopefully to take action. That's brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. But also, I'd also also say if if you're worried for somebody else, you know, try and be there for them. Try and be there. Absolutely. You know, listen, you know, be watch them you know be you know be be mindful of, of their their silences be mindful of you know watch them and and if if you you know if you're really worried intervene you know uh, whether that's yeah. uh, you know listening to them talking to them and maybe speaking to somebody else about them but don't don't leave don't leave them don't leave them alone because you reaching out might be the one thing that actually stops them from going over the edge I'm so glad you said that. That's absolutely spot on. And Sita, of course, covers that in in the fabulous uh, When Shadow Falls. Yeah, Zach, you, you Zach, must Zach says, he, Kai says, I can't believe that Zach let me, did not push me away yeah. because he, he treats him quite badly. But Zach knows that he's going he's gonna to stay there. And that's such good advice, I think. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. It, it is brilliant advice um so i actually have a question for sita um so somebody has asked if you had to choose one book to read over and over again which book would it be oh that's really hard <laughs> that's um, <laughs> okay uh, well you know i i i've i've mentioned my angelis collection of poetry i think the thing that i love about poetry is 
it's so nuanced and I and I have I sort of move further towards poetry in my writing so Kai's voice is quite full of poetry um and I I think the reason why I could read those poems probably my desert island is a book of poetry because you could, I could read them over and over again find something slightly different in every reading so I think it would be her collected works of poetry if that's allowed <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I have a question for David, um, and someone has asked, who has been the biggest inspira inspiration across your career? Oh, uh, biggest inspiration across my career. I guess I'm, I, I, I would have to say Louis, who remained my best friend, who remains that voice of inspiration for me, even though he's no longer with me. Um, uh, he he just his encouragement was was the thing that kept me going through those dark times. And now that things aren't quite so dark, uh, I sort of I, I still smile when I think of him um, encouraging me. And uh, and you know sometimes I wish you know we could laugh and and reminisce, but alas we can't. But um, I would say he remains for me my inspiration across the entirety of my career because. Um, you know, without without his sort of encouragement, I don't think I'd have still been in the game. That's really lovely. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, just uh, a question for Anthony before I end with one question for all of you. Uh, so Anthony, somebody has asked you, was there a defining moment that inspired you to become a writer? Um, when, I, well, I, when I was about seven, I wrote a book, I wrote a story at school about a Viking that came to modern day London and I won some sort of prize at the time. And I remember my <laughs> mum, my mum being so thrilled. Um, and I think that writing spark was always inside me. I drifted into medicine and I've had a wonderful career in, in general practice, public health, and I've, I've been happy with all of that. But it's always wanted to come out. And uh, straight after medicine, I studied philosophy and then I started writing books about philosophy and, and things like that. Um, and, and I suppose, is there a moment, that moment of that Viking story comes to mind? And then a moment when the wonderful um, fiction writer, Ruth Rendell, who's no longer alive, but she wrote, she read a, uh, a cat book that I wrote for younger children about a decade ago. And she contacted me and my daughter had done the illustration. Oh, wow. Her house. And, uh, and she said how wonderful she thought it was. And she actually read the first three chapters I'd written of, <laughs> of the five clues then. And she said, Anthony, you know, this is terrific. Just carry on. And, and it, it was it was tremendously inspiring. I found it sort of gave me belief and hope. So he's talked about belief and hope. And I thought, well, I'm going to go for this. And for me, that it's been a gradual connection with, with a creative spark that I think was always there. Um, mm. That's now coming out in a different way. And I think that speaks to what David was saying before about keep at it. You know, it's, it's all part of the learning process. Don't be afraid of life's experiences. They're part of, you know, what help us to develop and learn and move on. Mm. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so we are at the end, but I do want to end with one just very quick uh, last question. So if you could each just give your thoughts for this one. Uh, so somebody has asked, how would you encourage children to read for pleasure when they lead busy lives and have yet to find the right book to engage them? Uh, so Sita, do you want to start us off with that one? Just read short stories, read short stories, read poetry. Um, Barrington Stoke has some fantastic short reads. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a long thing. Just keep reading, read something. David said, just read anything. Read, read, the, read a bit in the newspaper. Just read a random story online that you just, it's all reading, yeah? Read a graphic novel. It might only be pictures, but it gives you space to put words in. Read anything. <laughs> Brilliant, read anything, that's the takeaway. <laughs> uh, David. Same thing, right at it. Um, uh, you know, you find inspiration in the smallest, smallest, story you find online as you say or, or, or something you something something you'll see on the tv or you know that will that will that will inspire me to sort of dive into you know we've got google these days we've got computers that we, you can find anything you know if, if you look for it so i know it's busy but i say you can listen to stuff these days it, you know there are so many ways that you can find to to bring stories into your life go to the theater get out there and enjoy enjoy life and, and 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 just find that nugget of inspiration that sparks your um sparks your ideas wonderful thank you uh, anthony 
The one thing I'd add, I think absolutely read anything. It doesn't really matter, but just immerse yourself. And I think the fact that we've mentioned um, um, audio books is really important as well, because it's not just reading the paper books and so forth. The, fact, the other thing I'd add is how do you, you know, children, young people, really busy, lots of things going on. How do you make space for it? And I'd say one thing I'd add is give the social media and the phones a break really do because there is space and there is time but it's filled with um you know social media and use of the iphone noise so with noise. noise and it is noise and it is mental noise and as wonderful as some some of those things have brought things to our lives that are really valuable important and important they're also very stressful and we know from our mental health education programs in schools how much stress and unhappiness and distress the overuse and overthinking of those media can cause. So have a break, give yourself a break. Reading is relaxing, it's distracting, it's creative and it's immersive. Lovely, thank you. Uh, and somebody in the chat has just added, and talk to your school librarian, they've read everything and they know where to point you, which I think yep. is also a very good uh, idea to add <laughs> on to that. Yep. Um, so that's it for this morning. Thank you so much, Sita, Anthony, David and Charlotte for that fascinating and really yeah. powerful discussion. Um, and thank you so much to everybody who joined us. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the event and that you've taken away some valuable ideas about empowerment and I think being kind to yourself most importantly. Mm -hmm. So once again, uh, a huge thank you to all of our panellists and everybody for watching along. Um, take care. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. bye. bye.